This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Okay, we're going to do a shift to another uh, perspective now, uh, the social issues. And uh, we have two speakers. Uh, we have Fauna Foreman uh, from UCSD and uh, Magali Delmas from UCLA, who are going to talk to us about uh, social change. It is a huge honor uh, to be involved in this project, and it's particularly gratifying um, to be holding our summit here at Scripps, where the legacy of Roger Revelle uh, looms large. We're obviously all indebted to him for his pioneering work on, on global warming and for founding and directing this institution for so many years, but he also stewarded a vision of collaboration here at UCSD that you know, problems that are too big and, and too complex for single disciplines to solve alone, they need to be engaged differently. And his legacy uh, lives on uh, for all of us here to the present day. Now our collaboration um, is, is unique um, and was particularly exciting because it emphasized the social dimension of, of climate change uh, in a way that few other projects on climate have done, really putting science, technology, behavioral change, and ethics into a shared conversation, which isn't always easy to do. Uh, but this was our, was our challenge. Now, you'll see that my slides are announcing a very different direction for our discussion right now, just in their presentation. They're very, they're, my slides are primarily provocations and images and not a lot of text um, and not a lot of uh, uh, numbers. Now, in our case, uh, the, so, so the collaboration, uh, my, my co-author, Gina Solomon, unfortunately couldn't, couldn't be here, uh, so I'm presenting for the both of us. Um, but we had a fantastic group working with us, and Maggie Dalmas will uh, follow uh, my presentation uh, with a slightly different approach to behavioral change, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, in our case, the social question in Chapter 7 really involved two major considerations, what we might call climate justice, an ethical theory of climate justice, and an emphasis on attitude and behavioral change. And I want to take each one of these uh, uh, in turn, beginning with climate justice. So our chapter was framed by the ethics of this concept um, and what we might think of as the disproportionate health uh, impact or other impacts as well on the world's poorest populations. The richest one billion people on the planet are responsible for about 50% of greenhouse gas emissions, while the poorest three billion without access to affordable fossil fuels are responsible for only about 5%. And in contrast, the bottom three billion on the planet suffer the greatest harm associated with climate change, and these effects are uh, predicted to become devastating by mid-century if we don't bend the curve. Extreme weather events, air pollution, drought, floods, soil erosion, vector-borne illness, wildfires, degraded ecosystems, and food insecurity are all linked to climate change, and the secondary effects multiply and cluster in alarming ways, falling down disproportionately on the global poor, those who are both least responsible for the causes and who are least capable of adapting to impacts and developing strategies of mitigation. The vulnerability of the bottom three billion has already produced a nomadic underclass of climate refugees, susceptible to the perils of human trafficking, 
forced labor, and the degradations of life in peri-urban slums that are swelling at a rate of 77 million people each year. In developed contexts like ours, oh, this is just a fantastic quote that I forgot to show, is the, the, the Pope linking you know, our approach to climate with the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor from the encyclical, very powerful. Now, the climate gap in developed contexts like ours is dramatic as well. Low-income urban communities of color especially, are especially vulnerable to heat waves and higher temperature because of urban heat islands. These communities are also victim of discriminat discriminatory land use, placing them in closer proximity and vulnerable thus to the outputs of freeway infrastructure power plants and refineries. The urban poor are also vulnerable to gentrification and displacement, which is often produced in the name of climate-friendly urban resilience projects translated by private developers into mega-scale urban infill opportunities that raise rents and drive diverse underprivileged demographics out of cities, destroying their social fabric and microeconomies. So there's an ethical point here. The top one billion residents on the planet are accountable for the bulk of climate change and its effects across the world. Climate justice as an ethical theory demands that they, we, bear primary responsibility for mitigating the harms and urgently mobilizing a low carbon global economy. Global uh, uh, climate justice then, let me just, climate justice then should be understood as redistributing the responsibility for the common good by placing the burden on those who cause harm. Climate justice further demands that solutions cannot be dropped down upon the poor and underprivileged as if they are passive subjects. This would inflict further harm. The introduction of new climate policy and technologies must be transparent and deliberative always accommodating local needs and cultural patterns and designed to activate local capacity and long-term self-sufficiency. This is not only an ethical imperative, but a very practical one as well. Without social acceptance and buy-in from the bottom up, climate mitigation strategies are simply less effective. The research on this is clear. Climate action in sites of scarcity is best achieved through a convergence of top-down intervention through policy and provision of resources with bottom-up climate education and avenues for participatory climate action that stimulate individual and collective capacity, agency, and hope. This brings us to the next subject. Our chapter explored equitable public policy planning and strategies in urban, agricultural, and forested contexts that have advanced the redistributive uh, imperatives of climate justice. But a central claim for us is that effective strategies to fight climate change require widespread and pervasive cultural shifts in attitude and behavior. Policy and planning are essential but not enough without genuine buy-in from the bottom up at all scales, from the vast canvas of public opinion to collective and individual attitudes and behavior at the neighborhood scale where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. All the research shows that localizing climate change is the most effective way to change attitudes and behavior. And this is particularly true of disadvantaged neighborhoods plagued by poverty, violence, failing schools, and failing infrastructure, where climate can seem remote from the challenges of everyday life. Proximity matters. Research shows that disadvantaged urban populations are likelier to become engaged in climate action when they understand the linkages between climate and poverty in their own neighborhoods, and when local opportunities for participatory action with climate scale impact are made available to them. 
making the negative effects of climate change tangible and present for people rather than something far off like melting ice caps and polar bears. Understanding how precisely they are affected makes it likelier that an individual will be receptive to the concept of global climate change generally and supportive of climate-friendly public policy. So the research basically tells us to start with impact, right? explaining it, understanding it, and end with participatory action. All this research is confirmed by powerful examples across the world, many of which come from Latin America, where top-down municipal and collaborative intervention is paired with bottom-up participatory process. The, uh, the examples are fantastic. Um, from the participatory budgeting exercises in Porto Alegre, Brazil in the 1970s, to Curitiba, which these participatory activities were embedded in acupunctural green infrastructure strategies across the city, including the very first rapid bus transit system in the world, which was scaled up in Bogota at a vast scale. Bogota at the time developed the most advanced multinodal transportation system in the world, linking BRT with bike hubs and a, a vast system of ciclovia and walking paths that literally stitched that troubled city together. But it wasn't just about top-down intervention, which was essential. It was also about bottom-up participatory pedagogy. So here is Mayor Antanas Mokus modeling what proper behavior is. It's biking from place to place. He, he, he rode his bike. He rode his bike everywhere. The examples from Latin America are, are dramatic and, and profound, and there's so many of them. Medellin, Colombia now, the world model of, of a city investing in progressive infrastructure in the poorest zones of the city. But the thing about Medellin is it's not just about the top-down infrastructure. They invested massively in public education and civic participation. This is the Explorer Museum, which was built in the neighborhood of Moravia, the poorest city, the poorest neighborhood in the city. It's a science museum right in the middle of this, of this neighborhood. You know, participatory activity in Medellin was essential. I want to end just with a moment's thought on the, uh, the role of the public u uh, university. Uh, and Doug mentioned local partnerships. There's, there's another kind of partnership that I wanted uh, to mention. We here at UC San Diego are particularly proud of the Community Stations Initiative, which is a network of research and teaching hubs that we have developed in partnership with local nonprofits throughout the San Diego and Tijuana region, partnering with local nonprofits and local school districts to lead climate education programs and participatory climate action at neighborhood scale. Here, for example, is UC San Diego's system. The one at the top is the Earth Lab community station based in Encanto, which is a low-income community of color in southeast San Diego situated along the city's most polluted waterway. And Canto is emblematic of many inner city neighborhoods in the US whose physical and social fabric has been disrupted by the imposition of freeway systems, preemptive water management systems, utility easements, discriminatory land use policy, and so forth. This is a rendering of the expansion of the UCSD Earth Lab Community Station right now. It's an outdoor civic classroom of four acres, replete with community gardens, solar houses, water harvesting facilities, an energy nanogrid, and other environmental sustainability infrastructures designed in collaboration with UC researchers and, and students. Hundreds of low-income students cycle through the Earth Lab each year with their families, learning about climate justice and doing climate action in very tangible ways. My point is that this kind of local engagement is something that universities everywhere can do to activate our public mission. We can all partner with local organizations and work on climate education and climate action in our own neighborhoods. This is one we're building in Tijuana as well. Anyway, okay. I'll turn things over to Megali now.
Thank you. So I'm, I'm really, really uh, um, excited to be here and to uh, to see so many people from so many fields actually, you know, working on the same issue. So uh, I've been tasked to give some uh, examples on how we can use information uh, to change behavior with some uh, experiments that we've been conducting at uh, UCLA. So I think the bigger the bigger question that we're, we're asking is how to frame climate change in a way that people will actually care about it and will take action. And we all think that here in this room that climate change is important, but in most of the cases, the impact of climate change seem quite intangible to people. So how to make them more tangible, how to get people to care more uh, about, about climate change and take action. So I think there are two uh, things that will help us to to do this is the first one is the advent of uh, information technology with the ability to reduce the cost of provi providing information about the impacts of climate change. So that's one thing. The second one is really something that actually we've been talking about a lot, you know, kind of uh, when, when um, uh, working on this chapter is the impact on health. And health seems very tangible to many people. And translating climate change in terms of health impact uh, might be a way to make it more tangible. So this is what I'm going to uh, talk about here. Use me to click. OK, I'm going to click it. OK, so this is uh, also what I want to mention is you know, this type of research uh, is, is, uh, is collaborative with people working on the technology and people working on the social sciences. Um, so. The, the, the example I'm going to uh, talk about is about energy and cons uh, energy conservation behavior. So the question we're asking is, how can we uh, use information to motivate households to uh, conserve energy? And what we've done is, is use some you know, information technologies and providing people with real-time appliance level information about their energy use and see how we can frame the information in a way that they actually take action and reduce their electricity usage. And we have used several framings. I'm going to talk about them here. But really, uh, we're kind of comparing a health framing where we tell people about the impact of energy use on health. And we compare that to a more traditional, conventional uh, framing, which is to tell people that you know, you save energy to save money. And so we're going to look at what's, what do people respond to. So this has been a little bit lost in translation in, in the slide making, but um, uh, what you know the model we're using, and I think it's important to kind of go through these steps, is to say, well, you know, the first thing that, and we've talked. I mean, some of the other uh, uh, um, you know presenters have, have mentioned that the importance, and Dan was mentioning this, the importance of actually being able to measure what's the problem, where are we? So in terms of energy consumption, you know, you need to see, okay. You realize that there is a problem. I'm consuming way more than I should. I'm consuming way more than you know, uh, I, I could do better. Uh, and that's the realization uh, to influence the problem. I can have an impact. Sometimes when we think about climate change, we don't really think about, I mean, we're not sure what we can do as individuals. So I think these are two very important uh, conditions. But then you could very well say, well, you know, I'm consuming too much, first point. Yes, I can do something about it. And then stop there, because I don't care. So the third important, uh, you know, and that's, where we, we, that's what we work on in terms of the messaging, the framing, is what are the motivations for people to actually you know, uh, change their behavior? Could be personal values. I really care about these issues. It could be social norms. This is because my neighbor is doing it. All my neighbors are doing it. I'm the only one not doing it. It could be pecuniary incentives. So these are kind of some of the framing. And the one that we're going to discuss more is, is health. And then this is turning, you know, taking action, turning lights, uh, driving a, a hybrid car. I mean, all of these different things we can do. So we're going to kind of compare different types of, of motivations through framing. So in these experiments we're conducting, we're providing real-time appliance level uh, uh, information to our participants. Um, this is done you know, in conjunction with uh, some of our electrical engineering uh, engineers and you know, probably something that all of us in a few years will have access to. We'll have these devices that will tell us uh, everything about heating and cooling. And the idea being that you know, right now, when you receive your electricity bill, it's like going to a grocery store and you get a bill at the end of the month, but you don't really know 
uh, what you bought. If you know your caviar was more expensive than the eggs, you don't know because you don't, just don't know. So you don't know if you're, you know, how much your plasma TV or versus, you know your lights are using. So we're providing this information. So that's the first important condition: measurement. You can't, you know, take action if you don't have the measurement. But what we're saying is that it might, might not be enough. So the first experiment uh, that we did at UCLA, that was in the residence hall. So as uh, Nurit Katz, our uh, chief sustainability officer, would tell us, we have at UCLA 70,000 people who are living you know, every day. And so we can use our campuses to, to do these labs. And, and we had some examples previously. So the first experiment we did in the dorms, we provided students with this real-time appliance level information. And we were so excited about our new website and everything. And we were like, yes, this is going to work out. They're going to do something. They did nothing. <laughs> that was very disappointing. That was we gave them information, but we forgot the motivation. So on the second phase of the experiment, we changed our, the way we framed the information. We put some posters with red dots for those who were consuming above average and green dots for those who were consuming below average. They loved it, they competed, and they reduced by 20% their electricity usage. We found a way to motivate them. So that's the first experiment we conducted. The second experiment, we con so with public information, the second experiment is comparing financial uh, information, I mean, cost of, of using electricity to health. And we believe that you know, very few people know about the impact of electricity usage on health. Where I'm, I'm using here a computer, it's super clean. Um, you know, if I'm driving an electric car, it looks really clean because the production of, uh, of electricity is often in a different place than the actual consumption. So I want to say, you know, what, what will happen if we tell people actually about the impact on health? So this is a, uh, another uh, experimental site uh, at uh, University Village. We have 120 apartments. We equipped with uh, this real-time appliance level information. It's a great site because everybody it's, has the same home, the same you know, microwave, the same fridge. Um, it's, they are renting, and they are our family students. It's also a great site because it's located uh, just uh, you know, on these two sides of 405. <clears throat> great for randomization, and that's where all, not all UC campuses are born equal. Uh, some of our students face the 405 as their views. Others uh, here, I could tell, uh, see the ocean and can go surfing. <laughs> But that's why they might care a bit more about air pollution here. Um, so this is the type of you know, information we provided. So we had different framing. We would t tell people here in the um, health framing, uh, you know, last week you use X percent more than the most efficient user in your complex. This corresponds to X pounds of air pollutants, which have been known to cause childhood asthma and cancer. So, that was one framing, and we would provide information. They could go and have a lot of more uh, information comparison by day, month, and, and time of the day. The other uh, framing was last week you used 20% more electricity than your uh, most efficient neighbor. This corresponds to $26 more over one year. Which one you think was the most uh, effective? Health, financial, health. Yeah, the numbers are really small, and that's what we have to work with. The numbers in terms of the actual savings are really small. So that's some people said, really? I can, I, this is all I, can, I will save. And we found that the uh, second message was way, way more, more effective. So uh, we have some information here about how people went to the website. But in the end, so we found that people reduced in blue, so that the health group re reduced by 8% their usage. The red, the red was not significant. And household with children, since we had a message about children, uh, childhood asthma, was way more effective. So that's kind of an example where we see the importance of framing uh, to you know, kind of the same issue. Could have a uh, very different impact on you know, kind of a consumption if you have you know, different framing. And health being, in that case, seemed to be uh, very, very effective. Um, we did, uh, you know, you might say oh, our students are, you know, kind of, uh, you know, are not representative. We are trying to find other sites to reproduce this. We did uh, uh, in Triple ITD in New Delhi, India, uh, uh, the same experiment, and surprisingly, we did, you know, find the exact same results. Uh, a 20% actually reduction for the group that received the treatment about health, um, and so uh, we thought that was kind of uh, uh, interesting. 
just to uh, you know conclude, so we are we're working in this area of using information to uh, uh, change behavior with different framing. And so our next, you know, kind of our last experiment is using an app that just came out on Friday. So I'm just gonna talk about it, in, you know, for a few seconds, where we talk to people about the impact, uh, you know, air quality uh, in in real time, air quality information. And I think this is inform in important because we kind of forget this relationship between, you know, climate change and air pollution and health. So we're trying to do this in at different levels. And this is a research project where we'll actually see how people respond to the information and. We'll uh, measure that. So I think I'm within my 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Let's have time for one quick question. We are running a little over. Question in, in the back. Yeah, um, I, I'm just curious, given the, the power we've seen in the anti-littering and the recycling efforts in previous decades that children really pushed. Um, did, did you look at how to engage children in helping move the messaging forward? I, I mean, clearly they have, they have the power of most households, frankly. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you're right. That's a very important point. The, the families, I mean, the, in that specific context, the children are, are often uh, toddlers. They are, they are really small. Uh, but you're right. You know, the, the, I think what, what I have seen is a big change in the undergraduate students that we are seeing. They have been through, you know, elementary school to, I mean, you know, middle school, high school, to very different, I think, awareness and exposure to uh, sustainability issues. And they kind of are way, way more interested in working on this issue. So we see a big change. And I think, you know, uh, the, uh, the school system has a big role to play as we, uh, you know, are in the, uh, you know, university system at the higher education level. But I agree, yeah. Let's thank our speakers again. <laughs> <laughs>